My name is Jerry Turner and I'm your host tonight. The purpose of tonight's segment is to introduce you to our featured Rotarian who is Gary Rousson. And this is Gary Rousson. Hi Jerry, glad to see you. Glad to see you, sir. Let's talk a little bit about your 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 a little bit about your personal life, Gary. Uh, I know that from being in Rotary with you for a number of years that you moved here from Fort Bragg. How in the world did you manage to choose Fort Willits over Fort Bragg? Well, I was in business in Fort Bragg for 37 years, uh, right out of college, I had an uncle that was in the tire and auto repair business and he offered me a job because he need to, needed not only a manager but someone to buy into the business and buy him out. So that's what I did for 37 years basically and I, had it, I got an opportunity for an early retirement. My competition in Fort Bragg lost their lease, they came to me and offered me a financial deal to lease them my building and location and take over my inventory. And so instead of uh, 65 at retirement, I was able to retire at 55. So I was a very fortunate individual that way. And my sweetheart, Kath Kathleen Welter, uh, worked here in Willits at the Willits News for 17 years. She's since retired. But she would commute from Fort Bragg to Willits. And after uh, one winter of terrible, terrible storms, uh, I saw the point that she uh, would like to live in Willits. I was completely against it, made the move, settled down over here, and have come, become accustomed to enjoying myself in, in Willits after all. So that's how it came about. Um, I know also from some of the stories that you've told that you're also uh, an avid hunter. Uh, can you tell us a little bit maybe about your last hunting trip? I can indeed. That, I just got back about uh, 10 days ago. Uh, Wyoming elk hunt. There was three of us in the party that joined my brother-in-law's cousins in Wyoming who had set up a beautiful camp with two big sleeping tents, room for five in each tent a big cook tent, and the first day that we hunted, it was dry and hot, and underneath the, the trees and forest, it was very crunchy and noisy, so we didn't see many elk on the first day. But it started snowing that night, it snowed for three days, we stayed in the tent mostly all the time, you couldn't hunt, it snowed that much. Ended up uh, leaving 18 inches of snow on the ground, and after it stopped snowing, it snowing and cleared up, the temperature got down to six and seven degrees in the morning. So it just froze the snow, and then walking on the snow was like walking on ice, crunch, crunch, crunch. But we did manage to get uh, two cow elk, and uh, I was fortunate enough to bag one of them. So we came home with uh, what we were after, plenty of meat. Uh. I suppose if you've done your accounting and, and figured out how much the trip costs, you'd probably be cheaper to buy an elk in Laytonville and send it down here, huh? It, it, it may well have been, <laughs> although the tag in Laytonville is quite more expensive than Wyoming's tag. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll stay away from that. Yeah. Uh, uh, I know that you were in Rotary in, in Fort Bragg, and I know that you're a longtime Rotarian, and I know that you were the president of the Fort Bragg Club. Uh, can you give us a little synopsis of your, of your history in the Fort Bragg Club before Certainly. we talk about the Willits Club? Certainly. I, next, in 2011, in February, I will have been a Rotarian for 50 years. 
And I joined in 1961 in the Fort Bragg Rotary Club, became president in 69 and 70, and transferred from the Fort Bragg Club to the Willits Club in 1998. So I've been here about 13 years. Uh, served on practically every committee in, in Fort Bragg and have done the same over here in Willits. I think I've been Sergeant of Arms uh, in Willits now for six years. And sometimes uh, I think I should be wearing a black hood <laughs> over my head. It's hard for people to love the Sergeant of Arms. <clears throat> And uh, I have to do my job and, and occasionally find a few people and collect for things that they might owe for not attending or not making up. Uh, but sometimes uh, it, it, it seems a little difficult because they don't look too friendly at me all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Uh, I, I also know that you, you brought with you from Fort Bragg one of the... One of the to me, the most productive events, uh, uh, an event that certainly I've worked on a number of times, uh, but you brought the, the Rotary Hospice Golf Tournament from Fort Bragg. And could you tell us a little bit about the history of that, how you, how you decided to do that, and how well it's worked in Willits? Actually, in Fort Bragg, uh, Rossi's Building Material sponsored the Hospice Golf Tournament for many years that I played and participated in in Fort Bragg. It wasn't a Rotary sponsored project. But after I'd been here in Rotary for a few years and, and it seemed that each president would, would ask members of Rotary to come up with a project that they might uh, like to be the uh, chairman of and, uh, and see what would happen. So I brought it to the board. I wasn't a member of the board at that time and presented it to them and they thought it was a great idea. So 12 years ago, we started the Hospice Rotary Golf Tournament and in 10 years that I was chairman, we raised just under $50,000 for hospice. I think this is a great example of one of the marvelous things that Rotary can do. You, you hitch on to a group of people to support somebody in their idea and you're able to perform a service for an organization in the community that constantly needs funds. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. Yes, and, and, and as everyone knows, related to Rotary, that service is above self, and, and each committee uh, that's gotten involved with this hospice fundraiser has shown that type of appreciation for, for the people that really need monetary uh, help that we give them. Uh, You've intimated in conversations in the past that there was maybe an event in, in your past as the president of the Fort Bragg Club that uh, you might tell someday. Uh, am I going to be able to lean on you enough to get you to tell that story today on camera? There's no problem. Uh, it's perhaps one I'm not real proud of, but it is, I think, a little bit humorous. Uh, each president is goes through a debunking ceremony after he performs his one year as president. Some are rougher than others, but basically uh, they're roasts, you might say. Mm -hmm. And during my year, uh, as young as I was and, and a fairly new Rotarian, it was a very ambitious year. We had lots of projects that got completed. What they were, I'd have to read the history to relate to you. But at the time of the debunking, they put me in a big high high chair and put a bib around me and, you know, did the whole bit. And towards the end, the chairman of the debunking presented me with a book, a hard covered book about that thick. And the title on the, on the front of it said, The Accomplishments of Gary Roseanne, President of Rotary, 1969 and 70. And geez, I thought... Well, that's a pretty thick book. I, I knew I'd done a lot, but maybe not quite that much. So I opened it up, and there was absolutely nothing in the book. <laughs> uh, okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, again, I think that 
one of the great things about Rotary is the chance that it offers individuals to take on projects that are much bigger than they are. One of the things that might be interesting to tell for your part is that after the number of years that you've run the Rotary Golf Tournament, I'm sure that you've had most everybody in the club involved in that in one form or another. How many people get involved in a big program like that? Well, it, it may be less than you would anticipate. Uh, I, I generally have about five people on the, on the committee with a few people that don't necessarily have to attend any committee meetings but do work on the day of the event. You are one of those people that always sat on, on the golf hole that we were giving away $10,000 if someone happened to think, take a hole in one. Uh, but again, once you get into being chairman of a committee and then do it year after year, it falls into place so much easier. You have all the paperwork, all the things on your computer, and you get it done re relatively easy rather than starting from scratch and starting a brand new committee. Uh, no better committee than yours and, and your wife Sandy's uh, Kids Christmas Committee that, that I can think of in this Willits uh, uh, Rotary Club that, that, that everyone participates in in our club and, and a lot of people in the community participate financially by buying presents for the kids. So that's a great program also. Uh, <clears throat> can we circle back to, to hospice just a little bit. Uh, is there any reason that you chose specifically hospice for that or was it uh, the fact that you kind of inherited the program from from where it came from? So actually I mean, yes actually that was it, it was just an inherent idea and and I thought it was a very worthwhile thing in Fort Bragg and therefore it wasn't being done here in in Willits and I thought it'd be a great thing for Rotary to do. That's how it got started. The other day we had as a program, if you remember, the incoming district governor and one of the things that she talked about that I thought was hit the nail on the head is that we know what we're doing in Rotary, we know how to do what we know what we're doing in Rotary, and we have a past record of success in doing those things in Rotary. So if you get Rotarians involved in getting something done, most of the time you're going to get something done. Right. Okay. One thing about the, the hospice golf tournament, uh, towards the end of my being chairman of that event, I was playing golf with Dan Pavelotti. And he came right out and asked me, he said, I'd like to be a Rotarian. We were playing in the Rotary Hospice Golf Tournament at the time. And I said, well, that would be no problem at all. But there might be one catch. How would you like to be chairman of the Rotary <laughs> Golf <laughs> Tournament? And uh, he said, well, that would be all right as long as you served as my assistant for a year or two until I got it under my belt. He took the bull by the horns, became a Rotarian, uh, did a wonderful job, collected more money with whole sponsorship than I ever could have uh, because of his contacts in the insurance business, I believe. But he did a fantastic job and has actually raised more money the two years that he is chairman than any year that I had. So he's doing a great job. All right. Gary, could you tell us a little bit about your, your, your family and your family life, the members of your family? Sure. <clears throat> Let's see. I was married in 63, uh, which ended in a divorce after 24 years. I have a daughter named Renee who's 43 at this time, and a son named Jason, who is 40. And Renee lives in Fort Bragg. Jason lives in Branson, Missouri, the entertainment capital practically of the world. And I've gone back to visit him, and, and on many evenings we have gone to some of the uh, theaters that they provide there and have a great time. Jason comes out to uh, our area, Every year, I fly him out here to duck hunt with me for one week. He is as much of an avid hunter, if not more, than I am. And he also is an absolute great fisherman. He's got, uh, I think, seven lakes within a half hour of where he lives from Branson to fish for bass and other species of fish. So now he has uh, a son, 
Jaden, who's seven years old, who's right on his heels doing the same thing. So I don't have the opportunity to take my grandson hunting and fishing like I'd love to, but he certainly has the same opportunity I had into introducing his son to the outdoors. He also has a daughter named Riley. Um, well, Missouri is a pretty nice place for duck hunting and bass fishing, so it yes. sounds like yeah. pretty close to heaven for somebody like that. Yeah. Gary, I know you've written a column for the Willits News for many years in Sportsman's Corner. Uh, how did that come about, and are you still doing that? Actually, it started before I moved to Willits. Uh, Kathy being uh, an employee of the Willits News, the man that was writing the outdoor column, Terry Knight, uh, for whatever reason, had stopped supplying the column to them. And her boss asked her if she would ask me if I would like to write a column. <laughs> I hesitated because I've never done anything like that and, and wasn't particularly good in, in, uh, in English or grammar or spelling or anything else in school. And, and that went all the way through Santa Rosa JC and San Francisco State. <laughs> so I knew my abilities. But uh, I took on the task and that was two years before I moved to Willett. So it, I've been doing it for 15 years. And uh, what I try to do with that column is, is, uh, is give the, the, the readers the opportunity for, to learn about subjects that they may not have the opportunity to get anyplace else. That's basically my point. But I enjoy it. I still do it. I don't know how long I'll do it, probably until they put me someplace. <laughs> the senior center or something. Well, Rhodey will be helping you if you go there. <laughs> Gary, do you have a golf experience that you'd like to tell us about in your learning years? Well, my golf experiences go back to when I was a junior in high school. Uh, Santa Rosa High School had, Santa Rosa had one high school in those, that era, that long ago. And now I think they have five or six high schools. But at any rate, I started competitive golf in my junior year. And in my senior year, I was what they call first man on the team. I played the best golfer of the other uh, uh, schools in the conference. And from there, I went to Santa Rosa JC, which I played competitive golf, then to San Francisco State, where I played two years of competitive golf. You had to play three hours a day, whether it be practice or on the golf course, five days a week in San Francisco State. So that gave me the opportunity to be the best golfer that I could possibly become. And from that point on, when I went to work for a living, instead of going to college, uh, the golf, of course, didn't get the practice that it needed. And my game continually went down a little bit each year, unfortunately. Uh, and, and when my family came along, I actually quit golf for about four years. Uh, basically, I was real busy in my business and, and, and raising a family and really didn't have uh, uh, time to, to participate in golf as much as I'd like to. But now I'm back to uh, playing more golf than, than uh, I have for a long time, being I'm retired. I still don't play as much as I should to be competitive, but uh, I can still hit it pretty good. Just to wing one, uh, I have played, attempted to play at the Brook Trails Golf Course a few times, and I'm certainly not much of a golfer. Uh, Earl Myers is a legend in our club for being not much of a golfer. Uh, what's the best round you ever shot at Brook Trails? Well, uh, at Brook Trails, uh, to tell you the truth, I couldn't tell you. Uh, I've never played it very well because the trees are a little too close together for my game. Uh, and unless I get a lucky bounce, I may be in trouble. <laughs> but uh, the best, one, let me just put it this way. At see, at a, as a senior at San Francisco State, I had, to, had the lowest handicap I've ever had for a period of time, and it was a six, meaning that you average playing six shots, six shots over, over par. par. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, 
of all the people that I know, you have the best handicap of any of them. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I we certainly can can't it. shoot to it now, but uh, I, I, I have a 14 right now. In your outdoor life, I know that one of the things that you love to do is fishing. Can you tell us a good fishing story? Yes. Uh, I can tell you many good fishing stories, and they're not elongated either. <laughs> uh, when I was at Santa Rosa Junior College, I buddied up with a fishing friend of mine that was a veteran, and he'd come back to, uh, to go to school on the GI Bill, and, and they, they're the best students. Those GI Bill students, they knew that they had to put their nose to the grindstone. Anyhow, we went steelhead fishing on the Russian River a lot. And we both had a 9 o'clock class in the auditorium, uh, which was a lecture class. So we were able to fish for a couple hours by driving down to the, to the Russian River. Usually, in, in that particular era, it was down at Duncan's Mills. And it was tide water. The tide would come in, the tide would go out, of course. And the, the river would get high and still, and then as it ran out, it ran faster and faster and faster. We fished that area in a, in a place that had a willow bank on one side, and when the tide was running out, it had a nice little deep run of about six or seven feet, so that you could throw your bait out there and get a little drift through there, which was important in steelhead fishing. We would go down there, and there'd be a lot of people fishing that particular little run. And, and we would fish for, like I say, an hour, hour and a half, jump in the car. He would change clothes while I'm driving. I'd, he'd, I'd pull over and stop, get in the passenger seat. I'd change clothes while he was driving, get to school, jump into the class, and everybody knew when we caught fish because they could smell it. <laughs> but the point of this story is that this little riffle or this little run in the river at Duncan's Mill, the locals ended up calling it schoolboy riffle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good one. I have one more fishing story if there's time. I don't, you know. Oh, yeah, Go for it. Uh, one other story that uh, I remember we were fishing in a boat, this friend of mine, Dave, and it was slack water. It was dead high tide, and the water was slack, and, and you'd cast out and then just barely reel your line in so your bait would move a little bit. And the guy in the boat across the way, about 50 yards or so, he had a fish on, he'd played it and played it, and the line broke. And about a half hour later, I was reeling in real slow, and I felt something kind of funny. And it didn't feel like a fish, so I kept reeling. And I got my hook and bait up to where I could see it, and it was a line across, right at the shank of the hook, a line across it. So I reached over and grabbed the line, and I felt, and it was a fish on there. And I said, hey, Gene, you want to land this fish? <laughs> and he rode across and tied it on his thing and landed the fish. Fisherman. That's an unusual story. I hope you found this interesting tonight. I hope you've learned a little bit more about the Willits Rotary Club and Rotary International. And I'd like to invite you to join us to meet the next featured Willits Rotarian.